Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Meshlove. Today, we'll be exploring the life of Peter D. Ospensky, and we'll look at the Gurdjieff work as well. My guest is Gary Lachman, who is the author of In Search of P. D. Ospensky, the Genius in the Shadow of Gurdjieff. Gary is also the author of some 20 other books regarding the history of esoteric culture, ranging from Hermeticism to Theosophy to Anthroposophy to Ceremonial Magic to the writings of Swedenborg and the psychology mystic Carl Jung. This interview has been conducted via the Internet, so now I will switch over to the Internet channel. Welcome, Gary. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. We've covered a lot of the uh, major esoteric teachers of the 19th century, and today we're going to look at the uh, unusual relationship between Peter Ospensky and George Gurdjieff. I think it's fair to say that they both had a... Uh, enormous influence on 19th, 20, well, 20th century spirituality and esoteric culture. Absolutely. And uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me on once again, uh, Jeffrey. Oh, no, I mean, um, Gertrude and Uspensky are up there with uh, people like Blavatsky, who's the 19th, and Steiner, and um, others around. Uh, but I... I come to call sort of the golden age of modern esotericism because they were sort of all operating the early 1920s. You have practically all these people operating at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Gurdjieff and Dispensky are absolutely uh, uh, central to a great many uh, developments at that time and then later, um, even today, but then later in the 1960s and 70s and so on. I mean, I first came across Dispensky, uh, who's a Russian uh, who was born in 1878 uh, in, in Moscow. And um, who, uh, when I was reading um, Colin Wilson's uh, book, The Occult, I mean, once again, um, all of the stuff starts there for me. And um, along with other people he's talking about in this book, he's referring to Uspensky uh, frequently. And uh, there's a long, uh, there's a section, sort of half a chapter on Gurdjieff and Uspensky's in there as well. But at the very beginning of the book, he refers to a book of Uspensky's called New Model of the Universe. And there's a story that Uspensky tells in there when he was uh, working as a journalist um, in Moscow and St. And Petersburg in the pre-Bolshevik days, the early uh, 20th century. And um, he's writing for different different newspapers then. And he has to write something uh, about the Hague Conference. And this was kind of something before uh, the League of Nations. And it was kind of a pre-World War I uh, attempt to somehow, you know, uh, reach some kind of agreement among among all the, the nations that would soon be at war or something along those lines. And it's something he has to do, but he just keeps putting it off and it's really boring. He doesn't want to do it. And he talks about having um, a drawer in his desk in his office where he, uh, he opens it and inside it are all these occult books, uh, books by people like Steiner or Annie Besant and Charles Leadbeater and um, others of that uh, time, uh, or, you know, his contemporaries, really. And, um, and and around this time, Spensky was probably in the Theosophical Society uh, in Russia. I think he joined about 1907, um, and I think he left just before World War I. <clears throat> but uh, he says how... Um, something about the mystery and the, the magic and the wonder that's inside these books is more real to him than this hard reality of political uh, world that he has to deal with and write about. And he says something like, "Oh well, you know, um, one more one more article, you know, loss won't you know won't be too great for the world or something like that." And he talks about how it goes off. And Wilson talks about how he too, when he was a young man, 
And he came across books like Uspensky's In Search of the Miraculous, which is his famous account of his years with Gurdjieff, and other books, how he too felt something like that. And then I, I, there I was reading that, and I'm saying, well, I'm, gee, I'm feeling the same thing reading, reading your book. And it led me to go seek these books out. And one of the first books I did uh, find was that, was that book by Uspensky, New Model of the Universe. And it's a remarkable just compendium of different chapters and essays about a variety of different occult and esoteric and scientific and psychological things, uh, dreams, the nature of time. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this, but this was one of Uspensky's central mysteries and consciousness. And uh, this whole notion of esotericism, this whole idea that there is another kind of knowledge that has existed throughout history, but we in the modern age have lost touch with it. And that, that's just sparked this whole sense of mystery in me and pretty much sent me off on you know, my own journey, my own path into winding up what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that Ospensky writing sort of on the brink of the First World War must have had a, a sense that uh, the social order, the political order simply wasn't working and it wasn't under anybody's control that uh, a war could break out and uh, there would be no stopping it and no controlling it and uh, it's as if the human beings were were powerless over their own fate. Well, this was something that he he says that he came to an understanding of quite young. Um, he talks about when he was um, a little boy and with his uh, older sister, um, how they used to uh, sort of look out the window and look at things. And he talks about this book he had called Obvious Absurdities, and it would be a picture of a man carrying a house on his back or uh, a cart with square wheels. And he, he says how he, he didn't understand why the things just outside the window weren't considered just as absurd as the sort of stuff that he was seeing in this book. So he said he has this sense of this, this uh, as you say, this kind of uh, strangeness about life where things seem to uh, happen no matter what people do or people are not in control and uh, there's all this sort of thing. And this is something that led him on the search for the miraculous that uh, he went on in the early uh, uh, 20th century when he was a journalist and he secured commissions from different uh, newspapers uh, in Russia to uh, go to India, to go to Egypt, um, to go to the Holy Lands and, and places of, of that sort and Ceylon and all this sort of thing. And his whole idea was he was going to be writing articles about this and this sort of you know funded his travels. But he was really in search of discovering people, you know, from whom he can learn things, schools. He talks about the search for schools. And again, this is it's something, it's a familiar, you know, uh, trope. You know, you have Gurdjieff himself later tell Uspensky about his own journeys in Central Asia in search of, you know, hidden knowledge. And before them, uh, both of them, Blavatsky uh, did uh, the same sort of thing. And so Uspensky is doing this. And the difference is that he returns from these journeys and he feels that, um, he hasn't really found anything. He came back a bit disabused of this romantic uh, sense of schools. And even and this is one thing I loved about Spensky too, is that he's very, very critical of himself. He's one of the, and he's a very good writer, too. Uh, he's one of the best writers in this whole esoteric uh, sort of genre. But he's very self-critical. Uh, and so um, he sort of sees this romanticism in himself, and he sees how, you know, he's had extravagant ideas about uh, uh, making contacts on the higher planes and things of that sort. And the irony is, is that he, when he comes back, uh, to Russia. Um, he meets the, the master who knows uh, in his own backyard, you know, practically, and that's uh, Gurdjieff. At the time Uspensky met Gurdjieff, he was already a renowned person in Russia. His first book, Tertia Morganum, uh, received a lot of uh, critical cl acclaim. Oh, absolutely. And it's precisely because of that that Gurdjieff sought him out. Um, I mean, there's a story that... Uh, Gurdjieff uh, told two of his students, uh, well, he told all of his students to, you know, follow what this man's doing, read his books, read his articles, go to his lectures, that sort of thing. And then he instructed two of his students to ensnare uh, Uspensky, to basically go and chat him up, meet him and talk to him and tell him about us, tell him about what we're doing and bring him here. I, I, we, you know, I want to meet him. And um, Suspensky said he's, his sort of romanticism is, is, has been bruised. He's not really interested in meeting any gurus or anything like that. And he's actually come across 
um, a reference to Gurdjieff in, in uh, this advertisement uh, that he winds up, you know, sort of writing a kind of ironic note about this ballet, the struggle of the magicians, and he, he posts it in there. But yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean, his uh, he was well known. I said in the Theosophical Society, uh, he gave many talks. Uh, he had you know thousands of people at, at talks when he came back. From his journey in Miraculous, when he gave talks about, you know, going to India, um, going to Egypt, uh, going to Ceylon, standing before the Sphinx and the pyramids and and things of that sort. And again, this is at a time when travel wasn't quite as accessible as it is today for everybody. Uh, so he was a very early esotourist, you might call, where he's going to to these, you know, sacred sites and all this sort of thing. And he's writing both kind of um, beautiful prose poetry accounts of being before the Sphinx and before the pyramids and Notre Dame and places like that. And then also, um, you know, a rather good travel, travel law kind of thing. And uh, again, behind it all is this idea of this hidden knowledge, this knowledge that we've lost, um, which is called esoteric, which is about the inner. Uh, and uh, so, yes, and he's uh, Tertium Organum. Uh, and he, in earlier books is a book uh, called The Fourth Dimension, which was a craze at the time, similar to sort of like what chaos theory was maybe in the 80s and the 90s. People were all trying to figure out what the fourth dimension was about. And you know, H.G. Wells, the time machine came out of that. And so he, re he wrote about he's often presented as a mathematician, but he really wasn't a mathematician. His father was an amateur mathematician. Um, Spensky was interested in himself, but he, he never held any kind of college, you know, uh, university position. He, he was a dropout. Uh, he, he never he never got a degree or anything like that. But uh, he wrote about that sort of thing. He and, was yeah, quite. He was well known. He was deliberately a dropout. Uh, I gather that was part of his philosophy. He didn't want to be known as uh, an orthodox anything. In his thinly disguised um, autobiographical novel, Strange Life of Ivan Osokin, uh, which is a story about um, eternal recurrence, which was Uspensky's, you know, obsession, uh, the idea that our lives repeat over and over again. And um, he, he goes back in the story, someone, a young man who's, you know, had this tragedy and problems and, you know, his life has been shattered and all this and he, oh, if only I could go back and change and he meets a magician who says, well, I'll send you back, but things are going to be exactly the same anyway. But he says, oh, oh, no, I'll go. And then he goes and then obviously the same things happen. But it's what happened in Spensky's own life. He got thrown out of school. He, he was, you know, he was sort of um, a wise guy, as it were. Uh, he was very clever. He was very smart. Uh, this is one of the stories also he tells. He got in trouble for reading a physics book, you know, uh, and when he should have been on some Latin lesson or something like that. So he had a very inquisitive mind. And he says he was very aware of himself from a young age. And he, oh, and from a very young age, he had the sense of what we would call deja vu, the sense that he had been here before. And this, this was something that it, he, he, out of that, he developed or, well, other people had talked about it, but he, he assimilated the ideas of eternal recurrence from Nietzsche and Pythagoras and a variety of other sources. But he developed this whole kind of uh, theory about time and uh, Tertium Organis about time too. So he talks about different dimensions. Again, this was another thing that was very popular uh, in, in, in the early um, 20th century, uh, the, this whole uh, the, uh, Charles Hinton and the Hinton Cubes. And if you don't know of those, these kind of, I don't know, multi-dimensional kind of uh, Rubik cubes that you can put apart and take, to, you know, put together, take apart in your mind and all that. So Spensky was writing all about that stuff, and that's precisely because, and that's why Gurdjieff sort of, you know, targeted him and said, you know, we have to get him involved in us. You paint a picture in your book of Gurdjieff as being rather uh, both manipulative in, in the way that he in, endeavored to ensnare U Uspensky and also uh, a fabricator, a person who is always acting, making up stories that you couldn't ever really know with, if anything <coughs> Gurdjieff was telling you was, was true. And on top of that, I suppose he made an effort, I think, to uh, in fact, an extreme effort to belittle everyone around them, tell them they weren't even real, they were nothing, they they, they were uh, pieces of shit. <laughs> well, yes, you're right. Yes, yes, yes. Correct to all of the above. I mean, this was part of his teaching strategy. Um, and again, if you look at parallels, I mean, the whole 
idea of ensnaring Uspensky. That's something Blavatsky did with Colonel Alcott. Um, you know, she she did it herself. She went with Alcott was up in Chittenden, Vermont, and was investigating these you know these uh, spiritualist manifestations. And she read about it and she went him because I, I think both of them needed a good front man hmm. um, in different ways. I mean, I think you know, not not to equate Alcott and Uspensky, uh, they're different, but they they served a similar kind of purpose. I think with uh, Blavatsky and, and Gurdjieff, but no, but Gurdjieff's philosophy or his 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 teaching was that we're all asleep, we're all mechanical, um, we're all machines. We think we have free will, uh, but we really don't. We think we're one single uh, entity, me, I, but we're not. We're legion. We are legion, uh, as we were told already. And you're talking about Spensky seeing this world in which um, all this sort of uh, mad kind of stupid tragedy comes on constantly, these kind of catastrophes going on all the time. Well, he's meeting Gurdjieff just around the start of World War I. And, um, and especially for Russia, this was a catastrophe because, you know, the army had men and that's about it. You know, they didn't have that. You know, they, didn't, they were like people who had rifles and no bullets and some of them had no rifles and they were just being... There's a, fa- there's a story Spensky tells where he sees, um, he sees a, 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 a truck go by and it's carrying crutches, but therefore limbs that haven't been blown off yet. Mm-hmm. It's sort of in preparation. And so they know in advance X number of people are going to come back, you know, with no legs or something like that. And the idea that people were calculating for that, you know, this kind of horror was the thing that made him think, you know, life is mad. And, you know, we're all, we're all, and he was ready to hear Gurdjieff's message, which, you know, yes, it's, it's very brutal. Um, it, it's, it's, it seems very demeaning and diminishing, but it, <clears throat> From his perspective, it's, you know, the only way we will strive to try and get a true freedom is to disabuse ourselves of the sense that we already are free. And the only way we will strive to get real consciousness is to lose this notion that we already are conscious. And again, I guess for Spensky, who already experimented a great deal with himself, he has a wonderful chapter in New Model of the Universe called Experimental Mysticism, which is one of the you know, best things ever written about altered states of consciousness. And he's in his room in St. Petersburg, and having read William James, he's experimenting with nitrous oxide and hashish as well, and things of that sort. And it's just a, it's just a fantastic uh, account of these these higher states. So he knows what these things are like, but he also knows that he can't make them happen. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he has to use these kind of crude methods to do this, and he goes already in search to where you're supposed to go to you know learn how to do this you know, to the east the mystic east and that sort of thing and he comes back empty-handed and then he meets you know Gurdjieff is kind of like uh, <clears throat> I mean in some ways I equate him with Kazantzaki's character Zorba Zorba the Greek he's this kind of man's man he's a very he's he's earthy he's tough um, he, uh, he's instinctual uh, and Uspensky's an intellectual he's a romantic intellectual he's he's is in the world of ideas and you know, art and beauty and poetry. I mean, he used to write poetry. He wrote short stories. I mean, we know him now, people who, he's not, I don't think he's as well known now as, as he was, say, you know, back in the 60s and 70s or 80s. But we, we tend to know him as, you know, the teacher of Gurdji. We tend to know him as the author of In Search of the Miraculous, which is, you know, still the best, most lucid, clearest account of Gurdji's teaching. Um, but before this, as I said, he wrote a novel, he wrote short stories. Um, he actually wrote, you know, some of the short stories are actually kind of funny in places. So there was a, he has a different character. And I think somehow, you know, Gurdjieff became his dom. And he, he said, okay, I'll, I'll accept. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll let you become my teacher. or You'll accept me as your, as your student. You know, there were certain kinds of, you know, uh, sort of conditions and all that. But then so he, he submitted in, in the way that well, I guess one is supposed to if you're submitting to a teacher. Even if you're going to, you know, if you're going to study something in a university, you have to accept that, okay, well, you know and I don't, so I'll learn from you. So he did that. And, um, uh, but, um, and that was the whole idea to learn how to experience these things without having to resort to the drugs or to be able to, you know, make them happen at will or have them at, at your own control. And I guess he was convinced that Gurdjieff was right. That yes, yes, for the most part we are not as free and 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 uh, not as awake as as we believe we are. Uspensky might have been particularly vulnerable to uh, Gurdjieff's influence because uh, he lost his father at an early age. Uh, Gurdjieff. Uh, even though I think they were roughly the same age, uh, Gurdjieff was like a father figure. Yes, I'm saying he's kind of this Zorba. If you know 
Nikos Kazantzakis' novel Zorba the Greek, there's a, um, you know, a very sensitive intellectual poet who, who goes to uh, Crete and he meets this vital, living, you know, fresh, instinctual character Zorba, who's just man of the earth. You know, he's, he's very, very much of his instincts and of the moment, in, in the now. He's not in his head all the time, as the poet is. And I, I tend to think there's something along those lines. And, I mean, you can sort of see similar with Don Juan and Castaneda, you know, Castaneda and Don Juan. It's still a kind of similar sort of thing. Um, but... Um, uh, there was uh, Gurdjieff was a powerful individual. I mean, he he had a kind of real uh, presence and essence, and he had he'd done lots of things that Uspensky wanted to do, or he went to lots of places that Uspensky had go you know, had, had wanted to go to. I mean, the first thing. You know, they meet, the famous story, they meet in this back street cafe in Moscow. I mean, the last place you'd expect to meet the man who knows, you know. It's frequented by small, you know, kind of business, uh, you know, characters and sort of, you know, traveling salesmen or something like that. And... Um, he has this impression, you know, he spent, it's a wonderful description where Gurdjieff is sort of in, he's poorly disguised on purpose so that you will know that he's trying to wear a disguise, but it's so obvious that, you know, do you say something or do you not say something? So it's immediately, you know, Spensky is very, he comes from a very cultured family, um, from the, so the, the intellectual, uh, you know, uh, part of Russian culture uh, and all that. And, you know, he, he's, used to a certain way, you know, uh, and he, he's, he's a very, um, you know, disciplined, moral kind of character. I mean, he was a poet and all that, but he has a very strong sense of, you know, right and wrong and, you know, all, all the behavior and all that kind of thing. And so suddenly it's, it's like, you know, he's got, you know, some strange trickster character in front of him and he doesn't quite know what to do with it. So Gurdjieff was, you know, very good at doing that. And he had already had a few years training doing, you know, different experiments with different groups before you know uh, he met with me. So I guess the idea was he was ready to go out into the world. He was sort of ready to launch, and so we need somebody like him you know, to, to get us out there. And Uspensky was just impressed. I mean, the more they talked, the more he felt that Gurdjieff knows. He knows these things, and he was impressed with the teaching. It seemed the more he thought about it, the more it made sense. You know, it was, it was a difficult teaching to accept. It wasn't something that he just swallowed immediately. I mean, he, he talks about struggle, trying to accept, and, you know, is it really as bad as that, and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because um, he even says, yeah, yes, I understand, and I've written books about that, and Gurdjieff basically says, no, 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 your books, <laughs> your books were written in a state of sleep and, and you know, me uh, mechanicalness as well. And this is something like, well, uh, okay, but, you know, really? <laughs> you know, yeah, that, that would be something very difficult to accept. And so he, he does that. So Gurdjieff must have been powerfully, powerfully convincing. Well, I suppose if, if you tell somebody you are totally uh, a robot, you are completely a mechanical being, and I see that and I know how you can be freed from this condition, that mm. that's a pretty good sales pitch. Yeah, it is. I mean, once you start thinking, you say, well, if I'm completely a robot, then I, I, I can never be free, right? So there must be, there must be some small little piece of free will or whatever you want to call it that, that is attracted to what you're saying. And, and, you know, we can start from there. So, I mean, even that, and Spensky knows that and all that. And, you know, it's the kind of thing you have to kind of, oh, yes, yeah, you're right. But, you know, the, the, the amount we have is so little that if we just sort of, take it for granted and we're never going to develop it and all that. But, you know, it is. And it's, it's something that other people say. It's not, if you put it in that kind of formula, you know, uh, you, you are asleep and I, I will wake you. I mean, you can, any number of different sort of spiritual and psychological and psychotherapeutic practices will, will sort of make that offer. Um, but myself, having been involved for a while in uh, Gurdjieff work in, in, in the 1980s, uh, I know... Some of these the things that I experienced were 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 powerful and they were real uh, and they were enough to convince me that yes this is is about something you know it, it somehow it has has a, you know it's about something concrete so I mean I haven't practiced everything so I can't judge it against you know twenty five others but I know from my own experience that it had that kind of character to it so um, and yeah you know it's 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 a specific kind of thing that you have to stay with and you know follow and it's a very um, what do you want to call it? Uh, uh, I, I don't want to say humble. That's not quite the right word. But uh, they, they keep quiet. You know, it's, it's not something that's advertised very much. It's not something sort of out there. It's something that, that uh, keeps to itself. Uh, and uh, that gives it a, a kind of gravitas and, and a seriousness that uh, I think many of these other things lack. But um, 
But even Uspensky, after a while, he, you know, this kind of trickster character of Gurdjieff, where you don't quite, you never quite know what he's doing. He gets a little tired of that. And there's even some other incidences where he really seems to him that Gurdjieff has kind of stepped over certain boundaries and certain lines. And after this, you know, Search and Miraculous is a fantastic account of Gurdjieff's teaching, but it's also a story of Uspensky's own journey. Uh, and then literally a journey from Moscow and St. Petersburg with, you know, First World War I, then the Russian Revolution, then the Civil War, and they get washed, you know, across Russia down to uh, Turkey, you know, the, the, uh, uh, Constantinople at the time. And they were refugees, like, like refugees today. Um, and Uspensky was uh, considered sort of a white Russian refugee, that, in the, you know, uh, and he certainly didn't like the Bolsheviks. He, he absolutely hated the Reds. I thought, you know, this was the not the rise of the, proletari- the dictatorship of the proletariat, but the dictatorship of the criminal criminal element and all of that. Uh, not that he cared for the czarist regime either, because his young sister was arrested uh, in the 1905 revolution, and she was put in prison, and she never was released. She died in prison, so he didn't have any particular good feelings about the czar either. Um, but I'm saying it's this fantastic story. And then uh, more or less at that point, Uspensky realizes that he has to split and he has to separate, you know, uh, the teaching from the man. And um, I mean, there's a long process of that happening. But you talk about the search of the miraculous. It's, it's when he's stuck in this white Russian sort of refugee camp uh, in Constantinople, where um, he suddenly hears that his book, Church of Organum, had been translated into English. A uh, Russian emigre who managed to get a, a copy out. And Claude Bragdon, who was a well-known writer uh, and artist and also architect, and he wrote a great deal about the fourth dimension as well, uh, he published this English translation of Turgeon Magandam, and it was a surprise bestseller in America and then in uh, uh, England as well. And... Um, uh, 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 he's contacted by uh, a wealthy uh, wife of uh, one of the great newspaper uh, magnates at the time, and and she'll say that you know she says to him that you know basically um, I'm a lover of your book and I I want to meet you where uh, money no expense wherever you want to be London or New York, and so uh, where before he was basically working as a porter for a while and he was kind of uh, teaching English to to Russian refugees he suddenly lifted out of this refugee camp and he's and he lands in London in 1921 and people like uh, T S Eliot and Aldous Huxley, uh, and uh, A.R. Oraj, who will be instrumental in, in, his, in his career, and in Gurdjieff's as well as the editor of the New, the new Age magazine uh, at the time, called The New Age. And um, he's there, and he's basically having dinner on, on sort of golden plates, with golden kind of uh, uh, cutlery and all this sort of thing, and he's sort of the intellectual flavor of the month. But what they know is, is Church and Morganum, and they want to hear him lecture about that. But he doesn't. He starts teaching them Gurdjieff's system, and it's a complete shock to everybody um, at the, at these lectures because this is not what they wanted to hear. Uh, but I gather uh, he began to build up uh, quite a large following, uh, going from being a refugee in Istanbul to a celebrated author in in London. Must must have been quite a shock to him. Uh, it, well, I mean, shock is shock is a good word. This is part of the Gurdjieff, you know, sort of uh, approach. You know, these we, we sort of need these shocks to wake us momentarily. Uh, but this was a very pleasant one. Mm-hmm. And um, but he himself, he never really t- took to particularly being a celebrity. I, and I think Spensky always kind of uh, he never really hogged the limelight in any way whatsoever. And I think he always kept to the side or kept himself back. And so after a while, well, he was sort of you know uh, being touted by different uh, different soirees as you know the, I said the kind of intellectual flavor of the month um, people like moved on to something else and he settled in living in a small flat over in West London um, for quite some time and uh, just writing having small groups uh, just just a few people one of the people that um, become very involved with him is a fellow named Morris Nichol uh, who started out as a um, uh, Disciple of Jung, really. He was Jung's sort of English um, agent, as it were. Uh, and his first book, Dream Psychology, is written from a Jungian perspective. But um, he hears about Uspensky, 
uh, and with some other people who's involved with there's something called the psychosynthesis group that they, they call it. They're, they're studying kind of different approaches to psychology. They go to these lectures and Nickel is just, just uh, bowled over and um, he comes away from it and his wife has just had their first child and he rushes into the room and he's sort of saying, I, I found him, he's, this is the man I've been searching for, uh, he's the one who knows and he, he had previously sent a prayer to Hermes to you know, say that you know, he was in despair and darkness and you know, send, me, send me the light or something along those lines and so he feels that he's met the man who can do that and he, he becomes in the long run a close friend of Dispensky's and eventually he starts teaching his own classes. Um, but about a year later or so, um, Gurdjieff shows up and talk about a shock. This In England he, now. He, he, he has complete, complete uh, total shock for Uspensky. Yeah. Now, you describe Uspensky in, in your book as basically having two different personalities that you attribute to his first two names, Peter uh, Damien. And uh, one is a very dour person, uh, which apparently he became later in life. But his the early Uspensky you describe more as a romantic poet, a fellow who loved to hang out in taverns and, and enjoyed a lot of alcohol. And uh, <laughs> something changed. Uh, his encounter with Gurdjieff caused him to become something of a, a, a very different person by the end of his life. Well, I think that's uh, yeah. I think that's sort of the. I think that's true. I think that that's one of the themes in the in the book. And it was his encounter with Gurdjieff that changed him. And he was said he was he was, he was a poet. Uh, he was a familiar figure at um, a famous um, cafe in Saint Petersburg called the Stray Dog. And this was in a period in Russia uh, known as the Silver Age. And it kind of starts in the 1890s, and it goes just sort of just before World War One or just before the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, but it's a time of fantastic flowering of art um, and culture, uh, and a great deal of it of a spiritual, esoteric, occult nature. There's an occult revival going on in Moscow and St. Petersburg, just as there is in Paris and in London at the time. And uh, you have people like uh, and Rudolf Steiner's ideas are very influential. Steiner had given uh, lectures to uh, a, a audience of Russian intellectuals um, in the early 1900s, and they brought back a lot of his ideas. So this is all in the air and at these salons. And at this place, the Stray Dog, there's people like the poet Alexander Bloch, who's a very famous symbolist poet. Andre Bielli is a, a symbolist, uh, um, anthroposophical novelist. His novel Saint Petersburg is this kind of eerie, strange, weirdly atmospheric novel about this time that has just saturated with a lot of Steiner's ideas and things of that sort. So all this stuff is going on. Spensky is familiar in, in this area, and he knows different poets and different painters and uh, other writers and all that. And he also tells stories that um, he was, whenever he got well, whenever there was a fight going on, they always said, oh, go get Uspensky and he'll, he'll settle it. And he somehow was able to kind of, you know, uh, make things work out between people. And there's, if you know Russian literature, there's this whole kind of strange, weird, slightly absurd, um, not Kafka, because it just doesn't have this strange dread in the background. It's more like a funny kind of comic absurdity. Uh, and uh, the, the, the novelist Gogol, is a, a short story writer, is probably the most you know, uh, well-known example of this. And Uspensky has this kind of character when he's telling these stories, and he tells some story about how through some long you know, night where lots of things happened, one sleeve of his coat got torn off and he never figured out where, where did that, how did that happen? How did that, you know, and it's sort of the thing like, you could, oh, the sleeve, you know, the story of Uspensky's sleeve and then it turns up someplace else. That would happen in some Russian story. So he's, he's in that sort of milieu. But again, he was a sensitive, romantic character. He had a much more romantic sense about women uh, and sex and all that than Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff was more of a sort of, you know, had a harem. Um, <laughs> this is sort of the stories. And, you know, uh, he, it was uh, not this kind of romantic, poetic kind of um, relationship or ideas about it. That, again, is a, is a Russian tradition, the whole idea of Sophia, and the woman is sort of like the eternal feminine and somehow the embodiment or the carrier of this transcendent meaning and all that. And Uspensky is in that, in that um, kind of tradition. And so um, there's all that. And then, again, he... He, he meets Gurdjieff, who basically uh, is a tougher character. And I think in some way, when Gurdjieff must have, the encounter, he must have felt somehow that there was some something weak, something small, you know, something vulnerable in him that he had to 
change or you know get rid of before he would be able to you know be awake or you know be conscious be conscious man man number five four whatever it is and um that's another theme in the, the book is that well you know that that's what happened because you say you know he was fond of alcohol yes he was but sadly he was very fond of alcohol and in uh, his later life as well i mean um not not to put it too bluntly but he basically drank himself uh to death in the end he became very very sentimental in the last sort of years of his life in the late 40s when uh, he was in New York and then, uh, well, it was mo mostly happening in New York. He was, he was very isolated, or New Jersey. He was in a place called uh, Franklin Farms in Mendham, New Jersey, which is not too far from New York. And um, he became very isolated there. And that's, you know, this is about 20 years on from, you know, the period we were last talking about, or 40 years from the Straight Dog Cafe. Uh, so, yeah, there's this shift where he sees this kind of... Um, I said, like a romantic philosopher, this is what I liked about when I first read New Model of the Universe. And because, because I read those first before I read um, <clears throat> In Search of the Miraculous, or got involved in the uh, Gurdjieff work. Uh, and so those are the first books of his that really um, had an impact on me. And they have this, you know, this sense of mystery and wonder and awe behind everything. And also, you know, all these insights into consciousness. Fantastic chapter on dreams. Um, Uspensky was... Uh, uh, an early explorer of hypnagogia, this in-between state between sleeping and waking, um, where a lot of interesting things can happen, and I've written about that in, in some of my books, and he has a very interesting chapter about that, and this whole idea of eternal recurrence, and if you're like me, you're a sucker for kind of time theories, it's sort of, okay, how do I, how do I uh, understand this? I mean, Nietzsche had talked about that before, but with Nietzsche, um, it's more of a challenge, it's more like, you know, if, if, if in his book, The Gay Science, he says, what if a demon came down and told you this life as you know it now will repeat over and over again exactly as it was. Nothing will be different. Nothing will change. You'll make the same mistakes and, you know, the same bad things will happen and whatever. How would you feel about that? <laughs> Are you tough enough to say, OK, yes, encore, because I've had some moments of joy and beauty and power where were meaningful enough for me to, you know, redeem the rest. Or would you just say, oh, oh, you're gay? Are you, are you kidding? You know, and so Nietzsche was a kind of gauge, whereas Uspensky took it more seriously in the sense like, well, how do you get off the wheel? And it wasn't the wheel of reincarnation. And when he talks about reincarnation, he talks about reincarnating into the past in order to change things, which is a very strange idea, uh, too. So he doesn't talk he doesn't talk about reincarnation that much when he does. It's not about, oh, your next life. It's about somehow reincarnating into some past period where you could actually, you know, stop Hitler or something like, you know, something like that. It's, it's, it's very odd. But this whole idea of repetition, and we, we know that film, Groundhog Day, um, uh, with Bill Murray, uh, is based on um, <clears throat> Uspensky's ideas about eternal recurrence. Uh, and so it's, it's seeped into the culture in some way. So, yeah, he was all wrapped up in all these kinds of things. And most of that kind of gets put aside during all the Gurdjieff time. And later on, he starts bringing it in sort of in his last kind of days in his lectures. If you, if you read uh, these collections of um, question and answers from the different groups he had in, in New York and London and uh, London and New York and all that. And he, he starts to bring in some of these things. And uh, Nickel, who's very interested in time as well. And if you ever get a chance, his uh, psychological observations on the teachings of Gurdjieff and Uspensky are absolutely fantastic reading. I think it's about seven of them. Uh, but um, it's, it's that teaching that he got from Uspensky, and then he brings in things as well, things about time, and he was a reader of Swedenborg, and also Jung. There's a lot of ideas about Jung in there as well. So, um, any case, so there's that, that, so there was this dry period, and at the end he started to do this other thing. But, um, yeah, he just changed. And um, it's, it's sad. There's, there's a, a sadness to sort of his last days. And, um, and, I mean, the book that he's most known for, he didn't even want it to be published in Search of Miraculous. I mean, he, he his sort of... Uh, well, what he said about it, you know, uh, he said he basically said, you know, this is not to be published or something along those lines. And so it was against his last wishes that it got out there. I mean, thank God it did. But um, he had a very um, bitter, or not it's bitter, um, what, do you, what do you want to say? He questioned a lot at the mm -hmm. end. He, he had a great deal of doubt at, at the end about the whole, whole thing. And famously, in the last lectures he gave, talked about a shock. Uh, he had come back from New York, and he was very, very ill. He was in his, you know, last months of his life. And um, but he famously said, 
at the last gatherings here in, in London, um, people asked him about the system. He said, what system? I, I don't know of any system. Uh, what system are you talking about? Who told you you were asleep? Who, who told you you were mechanical? Why did you believe them? And he repudiated you know, the thing that he had been uh, teaching for the last 25 years. I'm curious about the differences in uh, the application of this system between Uspensky and Gurdjieff. I have the impression from your book that uh, when Uspensky taught the system, it was very methodical. Um, <clears throat> it involved a uh, 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 focus primarily on an exercise known as self-remembering, remembering yourself. Whereas in, in Gurdjieff's instance, uh, he, he used many other methods and Gurdjieff improvised a lot more. Yeah, and I, I think, <clears throat> sorry, yes, I think that, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, Uspensky taught uh, the system as he had learned it um, in these years, 1915 to 1919, um, Gurdjieff. And he developed that. And that, that, he, he sort of like played a go to, you know, Gurdjieff Socrates, where um, Gurdjieff sort of, you know, did the oral teaching and taught by um, example and created situations. Spitsky, you know, put it onto this nice system. And so it's very lucid, you know, it's, it, it, it is very methodical. And it has all, you know, the, the steps in it and the whole cosmology, uh, the ray of creation and all that sort of thing. And yes, it's essentially about self-remembering, which more or less is having a, a, a vivid, you know, sense of your own being. You're, you know, I, I, I think it's something that, my own experience, it happens by itself, you know, sometimes. And there's a whole different series of exercises where you can practice trying to trying to induce it. And, that, and there's a variety of other things as well. Uh, but yes, um, when you get to Gurdjieff, it's much more, uh, he, he sort of, not necessarily they made it up as he went along, but there is a lot of improv, there's a lot of um, sort of psychodrama, uh, there's a lot of creating these, these it's, he, sort of, uh, he sort of created artificial crisis in a way. He made situations difficult for people so that they were faced with dealing with their own um, parts of themselves, their own mechanicalness, um, their own, you know, being. They had to, and the whole idea was to you know, have a sense of your being. I, mean, I think one of the fundamental things, Gurdjieff, makes the difference between essence and personality. And uh, essence is what you're born with. It's who, it's who you are. It's what you come into the world with. And personality is something we develop in order to survive in the world and to deal with the world. I mean, you can call it sort of persona and self or something like that in the Jungian system. I, I think there's, you know, sort of similarities there. Um, but what happens... Uh, over our life is our personality takes over over the essence and the essence doesn't grow it remains you know more more childlike uh, and the personality turns into this kind of shell or a kind of armor that we that we wear and and we, we take it for ourselves but it isn't isn't really us and Georgie created situations in which that would be challenged somehow uh, you know the limits of yourself what you know where, where you thought you extended how far you went would be challenged you'd be forced to go beyond those and the different sorts of things I mean he would create these kind of psychodrama situations another thing um, that uh, very famous for uh, with the, the movements this is something that Uspensky really didn't get into I think he had some sort of you know go with them but it wasn't something that was really you know involved he was much more in you know in the head you would say it's much more um uh, sort of a yogi kind of approach where Gurdjieff it's physical and these movements are I mean if you ever you know that kind of thing if you ever think about that you you know 10 times have you ever tried to do them have you ever seen any of the films of of the practice of uh, the, the film the, from the late 70s meetings with the Mark and old man Peter Brook did there's a at the end of it there's a, a section where they're performing the movements and you know they're very difficult they're very precise they're very rigorous they're very demanding and they kind of create um, what, what what I came to understand them doing is they sort of create the conditions for second wind. If you know with athletes, they push themselves and they get to a point where they feel like, oh my God, I just can't do it anymore. And then they just a little bit more and then there's the extra, you know, tank of gasoline kicks in and suddenly they can go and do it. And, you know, I think we experience that in different sorts of ways. So again, that's pushing past our limits. We think, oh, I only have that much, but actually you have more. And William James wrote a fantastic essay about this called The Energies of Men, where he talks about um, the phenomenon of second wind. And I, I saw the similarities between my own experience of performing the movements uh, many, many years ago, but it certainly, bang, there was one time I really felt, yes, this is what this is about. And 
And it was sort of like, I can't do it, I can't do it. And suddenly you find yourself doing it and you feel full of a lot of energy. And then reading accounts that William James talked about. And so I felt, and Jung had a similar kind of thing. This is what they call the bullying treatment, where you sort of force, you, you force the patient, you force the person to make efforts that they believe they, you know, absolutely impossible, which they are, they aren't. You know, they're quite within their capacity, but they, they've set up an artificial limit and they push past it and they suddenly have, you know, this influx of energy. And so seeing the, Connection between those things was something that sold me on it because I thought, well, they're all sort of talking about the same thing. They can't all be making it up. And it's really something about, you know, human psychology. So, I mean, I'm convinced that Gurdjieff knew, you know, what he was talking about. Um, whether the way he applied things or, you know, his method of teaching was uh, right for everyone, that's a different thing. And I think I, I got into some trouble with that with my book because I, you know, as you say, I, 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 I question it. And I question it, in, especially in his relationship with, with Uspensky. Well, Uspensky, uh, at one point, uh, it's sort of maybe one point isn't the right word. Over time, Uspensky came to uh, disassociate himself and his work from Gurdjieff to the point where he forbade his students to read Gurdjieff's writings or have any direct contact with Gurdjieff. Yeah, I mean, there is this kind of... Um sort of psychodrama that goes on uh, in, in the history of, of, uh, of the work, uh, as it's called, or the fourth way. And yeah, this happened um, I mean, it was in 1924 or so. I mean, Gurdjieff, uh, Uspensky had set up groups in London. Gurdjieff was trying to find a place to land, you know, after getting out of Istanbul, getting out of Constantinople, and he's looking for different places to set up his uh, Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. And he tries in Berlin, he tries to get into London, but they think he's a Russian spy and all this kind of thing. And actually, the whole time Izvensky was here, uh, the Home Office had so, had him under surveillance, even though he was, you know, fervently anti-Bolshevik. They somehow, oh, maybe he's a Russian spy. So weird. But um, Gurdjieff finally gets a place in in France. Uh, with a uh, lot of financial yeah. help from Uspensky. I was, I was just going to say, you people. just read my mind. Yeah. Here it is, live. <laughs> you just read my mind. Yeah, and mostly through the, you know, the contributions that Uspensky was able to get from people in London. And he knew some very wealthy and influential people uh, who had the money to do this and who believed in his work and all that. And so, uh, and he always worked as, you know, he always helped Gurdjieff. He always, always helped Gurdjieff. And in many ways, he stayed, you know, in the background doing this and all that. In fact, you know, the story is he, Gurdjieff stole all of his students. I mean, you know, uh, Oraj went, Nicole went, so many other people went that uh, were in Uspensky's group and they all went over to France to the his prairie in Fontainebleau, which is uh, outside of Paris. And um, that he sets that up and that's going, And but it, only in like a couple years, uh, it, it starts, you know, uh, things stop. And um, Gurdjieff has this car accident. And um, the idea that he had an accident in the first place, even though he's notoriously a horrible driver, I mean, that people were, you know, that they had fear for their life if they ever, you know, went for a ride with him. Um, but um, he was supposed to be outside the law of accident because he was awake. You know, the, the, those who aren't awake, they're, they're still within the law, the law of accident. So because we're not awake, we're still subject to chance and all this sort of thing. But he's awake, so he's outside of that. And but then. Um, <laughs> when you actually look at the accident, like what happened, it, uh, they find him um, sort of away from the car. I mean, he was driving. He was driving his uh, Peugeot, and he like smashed it into a, a tree on, on the route from you know, Paris to Fontainebleau. And he, he told you know his secretary, no, don't. Who usually you know drove with him, no, don't come in the car uh, today. They take the train back. And the day before, he had. Um, everything checked on in the car and, and the brakes and the steering and everything kind of double checked and all that. And when, you know, they, they find, they find him, he's off to the side of the road laid out, has a cushion under his head. Uh, you know, just like someone has put him there. Um, and they can't understand how, how they found him like that. The car is totaled. Uh, he's all scarred and, you know, it's a very bad accident and he's hurt very badly. And um, for a while, they're wondering whether he's going to survive or not. And it takes quite a long time for him to, to recover and recuperate. But somehow, uh, two things. One is that he did it on purpose. There seems <laughs> enough circumstantial evidence suggests, and Gurdjieff's the kind of man who would be able to do this, that he's 
somehow arranged the accident on purpose so that he somehow got tired of the institute and he, he wanted to move on already or something like that. And so he wanted to basically get rid of the students and having the accident was a way of doing that or whatever for some other reason too. Through the recuperative process, he managed to learn something and gain new strength because he talks about stories like that in, in some of his writings. Um, but Another side is that Spensky starts to think, well, you know, he, he's gone off the rails somehow. This is somehow a sign that he's gone wrong. And there's some dark forces are now working. And he's even thinking, is Gurdjieff going mad? You know, he's, is he, you know, going, uh, there's some, something there. And he's thinking, well, there's the teaching and then the teacher. And I can, I can stick with the teaching, but I just, there's something here I just can't, you know, I can't understand or I don't, you know, feel comfortable with or whatever. Um, and, they both sort of say, you know, it's, you have to pick one or the other. You can't, can't have two teachers. So you either, you're either with me, then, you, you know, you have to just forget about Gurdjieff or, you know, vice versa and all that. Um, and, um, yeah, there is this, there's this, there's a separation. And it's a very different kind of thing that Spensky is doing that, than what, what Gurdjieff is doing. And then Gurdjieff starts to, to write his, his ideas, which is a completely other uh, kettle of fish. Gurdjieff uh, wrote... Um Tales of uh, Beelzebub. Beelzebub's tales to his grandson. Yeah. Yes, and uh, which, if you if you know it, it's you know it's an enormous book that is you know not an easy read. I mean, it's you know sort of you know compared to sort of a uh, combination of Finnegan's Wake and Tristram Shandy, and you know um, after drinking quite a few vodkas to try and read this, because it's just it's full of parenthetical you know clauses. And dependent clauses and neologisms, and um, it's it's you know a real slog to get you know get through it. And um, again, the story is, is that either he's just a horrible writer, which can't be true because if you read Meetings with Remarkable Men, um, is his other other book. Uh, well, there's three, but this is the the, uh, the other the second one. Um, this is a very clear, lucid you know account of his early years and his travels with the, his group called the Seekers of Truth and uh, in in the Holy Lands in Egypt and other places and in search of ancient wisdom as everyone was. And his account of you know uh, finding the Sarmon Brotherhood where he learned his ideas and, and so on and so on. That that's wonderfully clearly straightforwardly written. So he he can write clearly. So he's writing in this this um, sort of uh, potholed way. You know, it's, it's like driving up a, a road where there's lots of potholes in it. You kind of have to either go through them up and down or around them and all that kind of thing. And it's to make it difficult for the reader to be able to, you know, get the real pith and all this kind of thing. So he's kind of set up all these booby traps to, I guess, uh, get rid of the faint hearted. Um, you know, that's the sort of thing. But he, he does that. And the story is that that's kind of circulated in manuscript um, or copies of it, and it, it, it comes to Bispensky's attention, and he just can't bring himself to read it. Or in, in um, you know, uh, C.S. Knott, who was uh, a student of uh, Kurchev's and knew Bispensky and um, wrote two accounts of his of his time in the work, he he talks of how. Um, He's in England in the 30s, and he's he's become friends with Dispensky, and he's going, you know, to uh, uh, his his own kind of institute he's got. Um, he has his own place outside of London, and they're talking about Beelzebub and all this sort of thing. And you know, he, 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 Dispensky's had a copy for a while, and not asking him if he read, and he said, "No, I can't. I, I, I try I try to read it, it sticks in my throat, kind of thing." And um, <sighs> Knowing the book, one can say, well, in one sense, yes, it's not, it isn't a page turn. It certainly isn't in search of the miraculous, which is absolutely lucid and clear. But that's not Gurdjieff's intention. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, you know, the difficulty that is made, this kind of, you know, um, purpose of difficulty, you know, is enough to stop Uspensky. But then I could also feel like, you know, I mean, if Gurdjieff wrote an earlier thing called The Herald of Coming Good, that is this mad kind of text. It's this weird kind of surrealist text that um, even he thought was too weird after he published it, and he had to, and he got all the copies back and destroyed most of them. And um, when Spensky read that, he he thought that yes, he's 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 gone he's gone off the rails out of his mind. So I mean, uh, uh, you know, it, it, they're very very different people, and in the end, they're just very very different people. And I I I say in the book. You know, for all his brilliance, and I, I recognize Gurdjieff as one of the great psychologists of you know modern age, and and obviously the great esoteric teacher as well. Um, but I think 
he misunderstood Uspensky uh, in, in important ways. And I also think Uspensky sort of misunderstood himself in some ways uh, by putting aside this other part of himself um, in order to somehow meet uh, this kind of, um, you know, this austere Spartan kind of demand of, of, of Gurdjieff's. Um, even though I think he learned things from that. He says um, uh, in, um, at, towards the end of In Search of Miraculous that he, he felt that he had something, you know, something did um, start to uh, solidify in him from all the work. And, you know, he tells stories about he had his own adventures and they were separated during the Civil War and he had to think quickly and he had to, you know, you know uh, uh, think on his feet and, and be able to deal with situations and, you know, uh, that uh, he felt that what he had learned was able, you know, enabled him to do that. So I think he did get something from it, but he, it, it other things too, it's like he sort of isolated himself too much. I mean, when he was here in London in the 30s, um, J.B. Priestley, who was a fam very, very fam world famous writer at the time, he's not as, as, as read today, but he was another time haunted man. Um, he's famous for his play Time in the Conways and uh, I Have Been Here Before. And the whole idea of time, he wrote a fantastic book in the early 60s called Man and Time. And um, one of his plays is based on. Uspensky's time theories in New Model of the Universe, and he even says it in the play. He even says it in the playbill for when it was on the West End, you know, whatever theater it was in. And he tried to meet Uspensky, but Uspensky wouldn't wouldn't meet. He he he, he kept to himself. He was very isolated. Um, uh, I guess maybe years of living in Russia or something, or being uprooted too many times or something. But um, he got this. Huge place out of uh, London called Lyne Place, and it was a big estate, you know, a big, a big mansion. And he kind of lived out there um, on his own. And he had the groups going on there, and his 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 wife was more or less kind of running them. And she was more like a Gurdjieffian uh, kind of character. And apparently, she was quite, you know, uh, quite the grand dame and all that, that kind of thing. And he's kind of off to himself. And what he did a lot in his last days was study the New Testament and different translations of the New Testament. And again, this. This is something where Gurdjieff drops a clue in Search of the Miraculous, where he sort of says, well, what we're doing is really esoteric Christianity, but it's Christianity before Christianity. And a kind of veiled reference, I would take it to sort of hermeticism um, and that kind of thing. But Uspensky spent his last years, many of his last years, going through different sort of translations of the New Testament. And again, he has a wonderful essay on on um, Christianity in the New Testament in in um, New Model of the Universe. Uh, so I think it's a shame that he's only known as, you know, Gurdjieff's brightest student, uh, and that these other works aren't as well known. Uh, mm. Because they're very much of their time, but they're very, very readable. And um, they, they, they still, for me at least, they're still able to evoke this sense of awe and mystery that I, when I, that I first got from them when I first read them 40-something years ago. You speculate in, in your book that uh, two things I think of great interest. One is that Gurdjieff would never have become uh, a world teacher as he is now uh, recognized without the uh, help and support of Uspensky on the one hand. And on the other hand, you suggest that even though his encounter with Gurdjieff was probably the most significant event of his life, Uspensky might have had an even greater career if he had never met Gurdjieff. I think he sort of says that himself. I think one of the things, you know, the stories is in his last days, he was taken around to all the places that he knew in, in, in London, uh, in England, you know, that were important to him uh, because he wanted to remember them so that when he came around next time somehow, you know, he, he would be able to remember the next, the next recurrence. And one can't help but wonder, you know, what this would mean for his encounter with Gurdjieff because he does talk about crossroads. There are these sort of crossroads in your life when you have an opportunity, if you remember in that recurrence, to be able to change things. And, you know, would he would he have accepted that invitation to go see, you know, uh, meet this certain G? I mean, he doesn't even name Gurdjieff in, in Search of the Miraculous. Um, it's just G, you know, and um, it, it wasn't even supposed to be called in Search of the Miraculous. The title he had is Fragments of a Forgotten Teaching or something like that, but it was too close to a book by G.R.S. Mead about Gnosticism, that a similar title. And, um, no, you know, luckily the editors, you know, gave it the, the right title. Um, but, no, I, I, I think you're right. And, um, I mean, one of the, what should I say, one of the honors or best things for me to come from writing this book is that I got a letter um, 
uh, from Tanya Negro, who was uh, Uspensky's granddaughter, um, well, sort of step-granddaughter. Um, uh, and um, she said that, you know, thank you for writing this book. And I, it, I, I think without, you know, my grandfather's, you know, contribution, Gurdjieff wouldn't, you know, be as well known, basically, or, or been able to be as successful uh, as he was. And that's just what you said. And I, I think that's true. And I think that's why he, you know, singled him out. I mean, he had other sort of lieutenants, too, as well. I mean, a R Raj, who I mentioned a couple times, who's a fantastic literary editor here. He discovered Catherine Mansfield and um, some other people, and he was the editor of this journal called The New Age in the early 20th century, and it published a wide variety of stuff. But um, he, you know, went and basically converted to, you know, Gurdjieff's teaching. He started out as in Uspensky's groups, and then he went to Fontainebleau, and he said, well, you know, Uspensky knows the stuff, but Gurdjieff is it, basically. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, he's being and all that kind of thing. And he devoted his life to that. He, Gurdjieff sent him to America. He was sort of his American agent, and he, he you know, Gurdjieff went to America a few times, and Arash um, had many groups there and all that. And other people, J.G. Bennett, um, I mean, he tried to snare Nicole, but Nicole liked Uspensky. So Nicole stayed... Nicholas David Luspensky, uh, and, and developed um, a whole um, uh, you know groups groups here and all that kind of thing. Um, so, but I, no, I, I think it's because he's um, look, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll be called a heretic or something for this, but I think you know, Gurdjieff said you know the first book to read is Beelzebub, you know, and I, I think anyone who's given Beelzebub for the, the first book to read to try and get interested in Gurdjieff is you know you're, you're being handed a hand grenade. I mean, you're just it's not going to do it. There's a story Colin Wilson tells, uh, and when he was a young man here in London, and um, he had uh, met uh, an intellectual who he was visiting, and uh, and they discussed ideas and all this kind of thing, uh, and um, he talked to him about Gurdjieff because he had just found in search of the miraculous. Um, in the Wembley Library or something like that, and uh, was reading it. And um, he was talking to him about it, and the fellow said, okay, well, you know, what, what should I read if I want to know more about it? And he said, well, you know, you should get one of these introductory books, like In Search of Miraculous, and there's a, a book by Kenneth Walker called Adventure with Ideas that was published around the same time. And he said, no, 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 I have to go straight to the source. I, I, don't, want, I don't want, you know, secondhand, I want to go straight to the source. And so he went and got a copy of Beelzebub, and he said, I, I don't, this is just gibberish. I can't understand this at all. This is somebody who's very intelligent. So um, I think that kind of preparation that you get from Search and Miraculous is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can't get it anywhere else. And yes, it's, it's a particular way of the teaching from a particular time. And I know there's all different sorts of things. And Gertrude was doing very, very different things when he was in Paris and his flat and the, you know, the toasts to the idiots and all, all that sort of thing. But you still get the basic ideas there. And if you're attracted, to them there, then certainly you'll go in search of the miraculous in the end of the books as well. Now, let's talk about that, the toast to the idiots or the toast of the idiots, because uh, I'm of the impression that Gurdjieff fr frequently regarded everyone else around him as an idiot. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess if you go back to the original idea of the term, it means sort of unique. You know, it means like your, your idiosyncrasies. It's, yeah. it's what makes you you. So there's something, and he had there was different grades or different kinds of idiots, particular sorts of idiots. I, I don't remember all the, all the names right now. But one of the things that um, he would do in Paris, in, uh, well, in, in the 40s during the occupation and, and, and also before, was uh, he had a small flat uh, near the Arc de Triomphe. And he would have these huge gatherings of people who would come for these lunches that would go on forever. He'd have like 50 people in some tiny, tiny flat where he would, he would be preparing this huge feast. And they'd just be crammed there doing that. And then, and then you know, before, before the food, you would have these shots of vodka. And Gurdjieff, um, though he wasn't particularly interested in drugs, although he did experiment them and and knew about them. He certainly used alcohol to sort of loosen up people's personality. He said, you know, the alcohol gets to the essence. And this is something that's very Russian too, you know, so, I mean, although Gurdjieff was in Russia, he kind of came out of Russia. He's sort of Greek, Armenian um, uh, background. But, um, and this was something that, you know, you would have different shots and there'd be different toasts and different, and Gurdjieff would sort of say which idiot you were. And this was kind of like a teaching strategy or it was some, some kind of thing. And you were supposed, you know, what, why am I that kind of idiot and what sort of thing and sort of thing. And this was something that some people who 
went there once or twice. They, 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 they people like Kenneth Walker. He tells a story about going there, and he was sort of teetotal, but you know, he he did it because he had to do it, and, and it wasn't something that he wanted to, you know, sort of do again. And then uh, Robert Esther Ropp, who um, wrote a um, f- book famous in the '60s called *The Master Game*, and another earlier book called *Drugs in the Mind* and uh, *Autobiography: Warrior's Way*. He was involved in. Gurdjieff's group for a while with Duspensky um, in New York, and then he also did visit Gurdjieff in, in um, you know, this flat in, in, in Paris, in France, and he, he was turned off by all the alcohol and all, all the kind of rich foods and all this, you know, the tobacco, the smoking and all that, and he was, I guess, kind of getting into the California, you know, health kind of thing. So there's some people who are involved who were turned off by that, but this was something that was supposed to be a remarkable thing to be at these, these gatherings, and Gurdjieff was able to create a kind of atmosphere and you know he had he had mana. I mean, I think in some ways, I think he and Jung were some similar. They had this kind of larger than life, um, man's man kind of vital, rooted, earthy kind of um, character to them. And um, and you know Jung was a good cook as well. And things happened around Jung. You know things somehow you know emanations out of his own psyche. You know the the pots and pans rattled and things like that, and so I think it was a similar kind of thing. They they both had this kind of power in some way, and just to be around it, you know, you 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 could feel it. Um, and um, so yes, I, I think you know Gertrude was able to create this kind of atmosphere, and Spensky didn't have that. He wasn't charismatic like that. You know, he was an ideas man. He wasn't very good in in, in front. He wasn't a lecturer, although you know his um, he he could read and write English very well. Uh, he just he spoke with a very thick Russian accent. I mean, Gurdjieff spoke about five languages at the same time, in, you know, and sort of it, people, it got across somehow. Uh, so they were very different kinds of characters, and so it's understandable that, um, you know, people who are attracted to Spensky's mind, his ideas, uh, but then they would meet Gurdjieff, they would feel like, well, this is the source, this is, you know, this is where, this is where it really comes from. Now, you describe Uspensky as being really uh, greatly disillusioned at the end of his life, although you point out that his student at the time who accompanied him in his last days, uh, Rodney Collin, uh, was uh, ha- had a very different view. So Uspensky is entering a kind of uh, saintly, almost a beatification toward the end of his life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's different. Well, it, it, there's different ways of looking at um, Uspensky's last days. I mean, one story is, as I said, that um, he, he himself wanted to go on all these sort of long, you know, automobile journeys to different places of England that he knew, and so he could remember and all that. And uh, him making all these efforts when he was a really, really sick man is basically sort of a kidney failure, I think, from from drinking too much. He had spent quite a few years staying up late at night um, reminiscing about the good old days back in Russia. I mean, he was very Russian, you know, and that you have to remember, too. He's very Russian, very sentimental. You know, here's the balalaikas, and I, I don't mean to diminish it, but you have to remember, he, he was like he said, and he did grow up, you know, in the tavern and all that kind of thing. And so there he is, isolated in um, this kind of community. Um, by himself, his, his relationships with his wife, and you know, are not very good. And I so said she, she was she was a very uh, serious, strict, you know, uh, kind of character, commanding, dominant kind of character. And he, I mean, he, he he could be, you know, they say he could shout Moscow style. You know, he could be tough and you know dominant when you know, he needed to be, but that wasn't really his style. He was much more gentle, really. Um, and uh, introverted, and someone who was interested in, in ideas, and you know, um, and uh, pursuing them, and all that kind of thing. And I think he basically, you know, he just wanted to be alone and not be really a part so much of all the activities that went on, because um, I guess they just they found that you know, just having the lectures and just having the talks and the theories wasn't enough. And like Gurdjieff did, they incorporated different sorts of physical activities on these, you know, the places that he had. So it was like farm work and carpentry and all this kind of thing. And while you're doing these things, you're doing these practices of self-remembering and observation and a variety of other things. And you're also interacting with other people. That's another part of it, too. It has to be done in a group. You can't really do it on your own because you can't see your blind side. You, you, you can't see the areas of yourself that you're unconscious of, you're not aware of. Others can see them. And through the friction produced by people being around, we come to see, you know, those 
those parts of ourselves. So you have to be open to that kind of intentional suffering too. You have to be able to put yourself through someone pointing out, you know, where, where you're being a jerk, basically, that, that kind of thing. And Uspensky wasn't really part of that. He was, you know, off on his own. And he would have a couple friends around. And one of them was Rodney Collin, uh, who was someone who started out um, too. He was a journalist. And um, he was part of the uh, kind of peace peace movement that um, people like uh, Aldous Huxley and, and Gerald Hurd uh, were involved in in the 30s uh, before you know uh, World War World War Two. And um, somehow through that connection that he had heard about Uspensky's uh, groups and he got involved in in, uh, in London and then later followed him uh, to New York. Um, and was uh, in, in New Jersey at this place, Franklin Farms, as well. And then went back, when Spensky went back in 1947, spent his last few months back in London, he went as well. And uh, he died in this place called Line Place, uh, which is um, in an area called Virginia Water outside of London. And he's buried there, and I've, I, I visited there with my partner back a couple summers, and we, we saw the grave and all that. It's, it's very modest, and it just, just has his name. It's in Russian and, and in English. Um, but the story is that, you know, the, the other version of the story is that Rodney Collins sort of made him do all these things, kind of like forced him to go and have these sort of moments. So, you know, either that Spensky would himself remember or somehow he wanted it to be a miracle in some way. He, he, you know, it, it couldn't just be that here's a tired, sick, ill man who sort of really feels like he's made a mistake, you know, over many years of his life. And he's come to see that. And um, I, I think in the end, he did have this kind of searing honesty where he, he just felt like, well, this hasn't worked. This hasn't worked. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not where I thought I was going to be by following this path. And, you know, uh, I, I, I shouldn't teach it anymore. And I want to free, you know, uh, these people from it. Or you could see it as, OK, here's one last shock, you know, delivered. One la what do you do now? I'm not going to be around anymore. Um, so you're left on your own. Uh, most of them went over uh, to to Gurdjieff in, in France for the last couple of years of his life. Um, again, this whole psychodrama story, what is it really going on? Is this something? And Rodney Collin looks at it in a big, broad, you know, uh, esoteric way. It's kind of like reenacting something along the lines of, you know, like the Last Supper or something like that. He's, he sees it in this kind of um, mythic kind of way. And uh, so... It, again, you know, it depends how, how you want to look at it. But um, I don't know. If spent, see, the thing with Spensky with eternal recurrence, he's already back in his life. So he's not in our life now, but he's gone back into his life. And so, I don't know, maybe he's figured it out this time, I hope so. <laughs> well, Gary, you were involved in the Gurdjieff work for several years. And uh, in in the most recent edition of of your book, you conclude with an appendix describing your own experience, and uh, I gather, uh, well, perhaps you could put it in your own words uh, mm. better than uh, me. Well, this, yeah, it happened in uh, the early 1980s in New York. Um, and strangely enough, I, I discovered someone, um, a friend of mine, who I was sharing a flat with. Um, I mean, I knew he was interested in this sort of thing, and he knew I was interested in it too. But I had gone to a lecture on the Gurdjieff work at some somewhere at the Barbizon Hotel or something like that, and I had just come back and mentioned it, and he sort of said to me, "Oh no, no, that that's not the real thing. The, 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 those people are bogus or something like that." And he said, "If you really want to know the real thing, call this." And I thought, "What is this? You know, I don't know where you're telling me now. Call this number about you know." you know, uh, getting involved in the Gurdjieff sort of thing. So I wound up calling the number, and it, it was a legitimate group from the Gurdjieff Foundation and, you know, going back in the history and all that. And, uh, uh, yes, I, I got involved there. Um, the person who was the leader, the group leader uh, that I was involved with there, he was one of the um, sort of principal sort of teachers of the movements. I, I later came to understand that. And um, we met... I don't know, we, 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 we met up in a, a basement um, sort of um, space uh, up in the Upper uh, West Side in, in, in New York uh, once a week and, you know, basically uh, talk, well, discuss the ideas, uh, sort of had readings and then, you know, discuss our experiences, you know, practicing the exercises and things of that, that sort. But then I, I, I moved uh, to Los Angeles um, not too long after that, in 1982. And I got involved in it more there. 
Um, and as I talk about in the book, um, it, it's uh, no, so I had some, you know, say, very memorable, deep, and moving experiences. I, I mentioned something earlier about practicing the movements. So that was one of them. Um, I had the kind of usual Gurdjieff treatment where I remember once being asked to paint a fence. And, you know, I thought I did a pretty good job. And then they came around and said, oh, no, it's not the right color. I said, well, you, that was the color you told me to <laughs> paint it. And creating this kind of, you know, conflict, this different kind of thing where you sort of have to, okay, well, you have to deal with the mechanicalness of your own reactions to, to the situation. And a variety of other things. And, uh, and um, readings from Beelzebub, readings from Search the Miraculous, um, and, you know, group meals and, you know, doing all different kinds of work. So it was all, you know, it was very much um, active in the sense that you're involved doing things. And the, what you're doing, the work itself you're doing may not be particularly important or interesting. It's what you, it's the observation of yourself as, as you're doing it. And, you know, it's becoming more aware of your mechanicalness of your, your sleep. And I, I can remember at one point um, just doing something simple as raking leaves and all, all that, where I, I really felt that, you know, what, what are these things in my hand? And, oh, these wet, lovely, glistening kind of things, what are they? And, you know, that sort of childlike feeling of your first time looking at something like that. And um, it sounds cliche, but I, I, I still have a real strong sense of that feeling. And that, you know, that was a proud of you know all the, the exercises and practices and what was happening at the time, um, but in the long run for myself, I, <clears throat> I know, should, should I say I, because I was interested in lots of other things. Uh, I have a very eclectic kind of mind, and I, I, I like to check out lots of things and make connections and put things together. Um, this was you know sort of not the thing to do. It was kind of like well you, you're studying this, and it makes sense. You know you're studying this teaching. You've come here to learn this. You've come here to learn geometry, not not you know something else, and but that's what we're teaching. So, but I just found in the end that um, to be honest with myself, uh, and there were different things. Some of the things we talked about here, I started to question um, some of the kind of um, well, especially so I said I, I, even as early as that, I, I was beginning questioning sort of this relationship between Spensky and Gurdjieff and what that was all about. And I did find myself more and more drawn to Spensky's kind of approach to it, put it that way, or just in general, kind of, you know, this uh, sort of philosophical ideas that he was um, uh, exploring, rather than um, the kind of tactic or strategies that were being, you know, used in the group. And my understanding, I didn't know this at the time, but my understanding was that um, there was a decision when... Uh, I don't know, back sort of after like Morris Nicol died and the groups that he was involved with here and whatever came from them sort of to sort of peter out and um, sort of the kind of official line. I mean, this is just sort of, you know, something that um, I, I've heard, so I don't know how strict this history is. But so the official line came to be like, well, we're not doing that. We're not doing that kind of thing. We're sticking to this sort of thing. And it's, it's, it's more, you know, Gurdjieff's own kind of approach. So we're not sort of we're not incorporating the kinds of things that Nickel did and that kind of thing. And I just found myself more attracted to that than, than to the other. And so I just decided, well, I, I should be honest with myself and with them and then and, and drop out of it. So I did. And um, there's no hard feelings. And I, I, I feel like I, I learned a lot uh, from it. And uh, I still have nothing but respect you know, uh, for Gurdjieff and Spensky and, and for the people that have you know, tried to uh, understand and uh, explore his teachings. Given the enormous influence that the Gurdjieff work still has in our culture, mm -hmm. uh, it deserves study and it, it deserves respect. But I have to say, when I read uh, that appendix you wrote, it seemed to me as if you were kind of agreeing with uh, Uspensky's uh, disillusionment, that, that you didn't, after several years involved in that work, you, you got some things out of it for sure, but <coughs> not, not what you felt had been expected or had been promised. I hate to talk about my level and all that because my God, I'm as unconscious as everybody, and I'm, I'm no master at any any of this whatsoever. But I, I did feel after doing a lot of the practices that I got to some point and it just it wasn't going anywhere with it. And um, when I would bring that up, it would be kind of like, well, okay, well, just just stay there, kind of thing. And again, just being my mind as it is, I just was aware of lots of other things, and I was very much into. Uh, Colin Wilson's work uh, at this, this and had been. I mean, in fact, you know, um, his little book on 
very gentle the war against sleep which i read that came out in 1980 and I, I i read that and i also had read james webb's huge um um, study the harmonious circle around the same time and, and these were books that led me towards okay I, if i'm reading about this some you know studying it i should actually try to to do it at some point but some of colin wilson's reservations about Gurdjieff's approach um, stayed with me as well. And so I, I, I just felt like, well, like Uspensky said himself, you know, if at some point you, you think, you know, um, this is a good way, but it's not my way. You know, it's not, it's not the way itself isn't bad, but it's not the way I, I should go. And this was something that he felt in, himself after about uh, 1920 or so, when we'd already been with, you know, Gurdjieff for quite some time. And he stayed, you know, and he helped him. He did a variety of different things. They tried to work together. But in the end, he felt like, well, this is just not. And he, in the end, you just have to trust yourself, I guess, you know, otherwise you're just always thinking, well, and the whole point of these things is to get you to trust yourself, is to get you to sort of trust your own, your own feelings, you know. Well, just uh, by way of disclosure, I was also involved in uh, the Gurdjieff group briefly in 1969. Uh, I, I was quite interested and I attended a meeting and they gave me an exercise. They said you, they wanted me to write an essay on uh, the difference between essence and personality, which you talked about earlier. And I mm -hmm. came back to the second meeting and I hadn't written the essay and they said, you're too lazy for all of this. Goodbye. We don't want you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that wow. was my experience. <laughs> well, you know, hey, hey, who knows? It could have been good. I mean, um, you know, what I tend to do, because I, you know, I've been on the show uh, you know, quite a few times. Yeah. I, I write about different people and I, I see connections between them, you know, mm -hmm. and to me, it's more important to see the connections between them rather than well, we have the truth and, you know, you know, only this way. And if you don't follow this way, you know, there's no salvation outside the church or something like that. I mean, I, I can understand the need to uh, keep your integrity and keep your identity, but um, I think at this point, it's more important to be able to see connections between these things. Just like I said before, and I was talking about um, uh, you know, this whole idea of, of second wind and, and the Gurdjieff movement pushing you into, you know, pushing past your limits and breaking into what he calls the, the, the accumulators. We have these sort of um, things that carry our tanks of energy, basically. And there's, there's a small one we use for everyday things. And we think, oh, I'm, I'm exhausted. But if some emergency comes up, we can tap into the other one and so on and so on. So seeing connections between all that stuff makes me feel like, well, this is this is real. It's about something real. And I, I don't care if it comes from the Sarmung Brotherhood. Or, or if it comes from Gurdjieff's own very fertile mind. And I, I suspect it's, I don't know, 70-30? I, I don't know, 60-40? Uh, but it, it doesn't matter. The source of it to me isn't what's important. I mean, that that's the kind of aura of the esoteric aura, and this is the real tradition, that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm not particularly interested in that. I'm pragmatic. I'm saying, well, does it work? Do, you know, does it? And I, I think it does work, you know, I, I, at least in that context. I can see it. The other side of it, it becomes a whole way of life kind of thing. And that's, that's the other, and again, I'm nothing against people who do that, but that's not something I've ever been sort of attracted to, where you, you know, you have, you have your whole aesthetic, your whole, everything around you somehow is, is connected or apart or, um, emanates that. And I, you know, I, I have too much interest to have any one thing. It's just a grab bag of tons of stuff back here. So. <laughs> well, I think you and I probably share that in common. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Gary, once again, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, uh, insightful about a very uh, important esoteric movement that's still having an enormous impact today. Thank you well, for being absolutely. with me. And thank you for having me on again. It's a great pleasure, and I look forward to more. Thank you.